Tales from the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. The story of the goblins who stole a gravedigger on Christmas Eve. In an old abbey town a long, long while ago, there lived a man. This man was both the sexton and gravedigger in a churchyard. His name was Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel Grubb was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow. A morose and lonely man who consorted with nobody but himself and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket. He would eye each merry face as it passed him by with a deep scowl of malice. This was difficult for anyone to experience without feeling the worst for it. One Christmas Eve, a little before twilight, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lit his lantern, and headed towards the old churchyard, for he had a grave to finish by morning. Feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits if he went on with his work at once. As he walked up the ancient street, he saw the cheerful lights of blazing fires gleaming through the windows, heard the loud laughs and gleeful shouts of those who gathered around him. He noticed the bustling preparations for the next day's celebrations, smelled the numerous savoury smells as they steamed up in clouds from kitchen windows. This was all gall and wormwood to the heart of Gabriel Grubb. Groups of children bounded out of the houses and ran across the road. Before knocking at the opposite door, they were met by half a dozen curly-haired little rascals who crowded round them as they flocked upstairs to spend the evening in their Christmas games. Gabriel smiled grimly at this and clutched the handle of his spade with a firmer grip as he thought of... Measles, scarlet fever, thrash, hoping cough... ...and a good many other sources of consolation to him. In this happy frame of mind, he strode along, returning a short, sullen growl to the good-humoured greetings of neighbours as now and then they passed him. Merry Christmas! Mm. Eventually... He turned into the dark lane that led to the churchyard. Now, Gabriel had been looking forward to reaching this lane because it was, generally speaking, a mournful and lonely place. The townspeople did not much care to venture there, except in broad daylight when the sun was shining. So he was not a little indignant to hear a voice roaring out some jolly song about a Merry Christmas in this very sanctuary. His sanctuary that was called Coffin Lane ever since the days of the old abbey and its shaven-headed monks. Gabriel walked on, and as the voice drew nearer, he saw it came from a small boy hurrying along to join one of the little parties in the street. Gabriel waited until the boy came up, grabbed him and wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times just to teach him to modulate his voice. <laughs> the boy hurried away and a gleeful grub entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, set down his lantern and jumped into the unfinished grave. He worked at it for an hour or so with much good will. But the earth was hardened with frost. It was difficult to break up and shovel out. Although there was a moon, it was a very young one, shedding little light upon the graves that stood in the shadow of the church. At any other time, these obstacles would have made Gabriel Grubb very moody and miserable. But he was so pleased with having stopped the small boys singing that he took little heed of a scant progress he had made. When he had finished, he looked down into the grave with grim satisfaction murmuring to himself as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one. A few feet of cold earth when life is done. A stone at the head, a stone at the feet. A juicy meal for the worms to eat. 
Rank grass overhead and damp clay around. Brave lodgings for one, these in holy ground. <laughs> oh, oh, a coffin at Christmas. A Christmas box. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Hey? Alarmed, Gabriel paused in the act of raising the wicker bottle to his lips and looked around. In the pale moonlight, the churchyard was as still and quiet as the bottom of the oldest grave. The cold hoarfrost glistened on the tombstones, sparkling like rows of gems. The snow lay hard and crisp on the ground, spread over the thickly strewn mounds of earth. It formed a cover so white and smooth that it seemed as if corpses lay there, hidden only by their winding sheets. All was so cold. And still. Nah, it was the echoes. It was not. <coughs> Gabriel stood rooted to the spot with astonishment and terror. His eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone was a strange, unearthly figure, no being of this world. Her long, fantastic legs were raised and crossed in a quaint, fantastic way. Her sinewy arms were bare with hands resting on her knees. On her short, round body, she wore a close-cut outfit ornamented with small slashes. A short cloak dangled at her back with the collar cut into curious peaks like a ruff. Her shoes curled up at the toes into long points and on her head was a broad-brimmed sugarloaf hat, garnished with a single feather. The goblin looked as if she had sat on the same tombstone very comfortably for two or three hundred years. And she was grinning, goblinly. It was not the echoes. <gasps> what do you do here on Christmas Eve? <laughs> I came to dig a grave, uh, ma'am. What man wanders among graves and churchyards on a night such as this? Gabriel looked fearfully round, but there was nothing to be seen. What have you got in that bottle? Gin, ma'am. You, you ain't with the excise department, are you? Who drinks gin alone in a churchyard on such a night as this? And who then is our fair and lawful prize? Well, Gabriel, what do you say to these? The goblin kicked up her feet extravagantly on either side of the tombstone. She then looked longingly at her turned-up boot points with as much admiration as if she were contemplating the most fashionable pair of boots in Bond Street. It's, it's very curious, Mum. Very curious and very pretty, but I think I'll go back and finish my work, Mum, if you please. Work? What work? The grave. Mum, ma making a grave. Oh, the grave, huh? Who makes graves at a time when all other men and women are merry and takes pleasure in it? I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel. Uh, under favour, Mum. I don't think they can, Mum. They don't know me, Mum. I don't think the ladies and gentlemen have ever seen me, Mum. Oh, yes, they have. We know the man with the sulky face and grim scowl that came down the street tonight. Throwing his evil looks at the children and grasping his burying spade tighter. We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart because the boy could be merry and he could not. We know him. We know him. <laughs> Ah! 
suddenly, the goblin threw her legs up in the air and stood on her head. Or rather, the very point of her sugarloaf hat. Then, at the narrow edge of the tombstone, she performed a spectacular somersault with extraordinary agility, right to the sexton's feet. Oh, I'm afraid I must leave you, Mum. Leave us? Gabriel Grum going to leave us? <laughs> As the goblin laughed, a brilliant illumination appeared in the windows of the church for an instant. and then promptly disappeared. The organ peeled forth a lively air and whole troops of goblins poured into the churchyard. They began playing leapfrog over the tombstones, never stopping for an instant, but topping the highest of them, one after the other with the most marvellous dexterity. The female goblin was the most astonishing jumper and none of the other goblins could come near her. Even in the extremity of his terror, the sexton could not help observing that she easily leapt over the highest of the family vaults, iron railings and all. Whee! With as much ease as if they had been so many street posts. Quickly, the game reached a most exciting pitch. The organ played quicker and quicker. The goblins leapt faster and faster, coiling themselves up rolling head over heels and bounding over the gravestones like footballs. The sexton's brain whirled around with the rapidity of the motion he saw. His legs began to reel beneath him as the spirits flew before his eyes. Come with me! The goblin queen had darted towards him, laid her hand upon his collar and sank with him through the earth. Ah! When Gabriel Grubb had had time to fetch his breath, he found himself in what appeared to be a huge cavern, surrounded by crowds of goblins, ugly and grim. He stood paralysed as he saw his friend from the churchyard. She was in the centre of the room, on a raised seat in front of him. Cold night tonight. Very cold. A glass of something warm here. At her command... Half a dozen officious, smiling goblins, who Gabriel imagined to be courtiers, promptly disappeared and returned with two goblets of liquid fire, which they presented to the queen. The queen tossed down the flaming, fiery brew, which made her cheeks and throat transparent. This warms me indeed. Offer the same to Mr. Grubb! No! <laughs> I'm not in the habit of taking anything warm at night. One of the goblins grabbed and held him, while another poured the blazing liquid down his throat. And now, show the man of misery and gloom a few pictures from our own great storehouse. As the Queen said this, a thick cloud which obscured the remoter end of the cavern rolled away to disclose, apparently at a great distance, a small and scantily furnished apartment. A crowd of little children were gathered round a bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown and dancing around her chair. The mother occasionally rose and drew aside the curtains as if to look for some expected object. A frugal meal was ready on the table and an armchair placed by the fire. A knock was heard at the door and the children crowded round to their mother as their father entered. Wet and weary, he shook the snow from his garments and the children gathered round him. Then, as he sat down to his meal before the fire, they climbed on his knee and the mother sat by his side. All seemed happiness and comfort. A change came upon the view, almost imperceptibly. The new scene was of a small bedroom, where the fairest and youngest child lay dying. The colour had fled from his cheeks and the light from his eyes. 
As the sexton looked upon him with an interest he had never known before, the child died. His young brothers and sisters crowded round his little bed and looked with awe on the infant face. Calm and tranquil as it was, they saw that he was dead and they knew. Again, the cloud passed across the scene and the subject changed once more. The father and mother were now old and helpless. The number of those about them was diminished by more than half. But cheerfulness sat on every face as they crowded round the fireside and told or listened to stories of earlier bygone days. Slowly and peacefully, the father sank into the grave, followed by the mother. The few who yet survived them kneeled by their tomb, rose and turned away sadly and mournfully. But not with bitter cries or despairing lamentation, for they knew one day they should meet again. Once more, they mixed with the busy world and their cheerfulness was restored. What do you think of that? Well, it, it was very... Um, pretty. Pretty? You miserable man! You... In her anger, the Goblin Queen lifted up one of her very pliable legs. Flourishing it above her head to take aim, she administered a good, sound kick to the sexton. Ow! After which, all the goblins in waiting crowded round the wretched sexton and kicked him without mercy. Oh! Many a time the cloud came and went. Many a lesson it taught to Gabriel Grubb. Despite his body smarting with pain from the frequent goblin kicks, he looked on with an interest that nothing could diminish. He saw that men worked hard, earned their scanty bread with lives of labour and were cheerful and happy that women were most often far superior to sorrow, adversity and distress. Above all, he saw that men and women like himself, who snarled at the mirth and cheerfulness of others, were the foulest weeds on the fair surface of the earth. Setting all the good of the world against the evil, he came to the conclusion that it was a very decent and respectable world after all. No sooner had he formed this thought than the cloud which closed over the last picture seemed to settle on his senses, lulling him into drowsiness. One by one, the goblins faded from sight. As the last one disappeared, he sank into sleep. The day had broken when Gabriel Grubb awoke. He found himself lying full length on a flat gravestone in the churchyard. The wicker bottle was at his side. Empty. The stone on which he had first seen the Goblin Queen stood bolt upright before him. His coat and tools lay scattered on the ground. Everything was well whitened by the night's frost. Did this really happen? Were there goblins here? Ah, whoa! The acute pain in his shoulders and other parts assured him that the kicking of the goblins was certainly not a dream. So Gabriel Grubb rose painfully to his feet as well as he could. Brushing the frost from his coat, he put it on and turned his face toward the town. But Gabriel Grubb was an altered man. He could not bear the thought of returning to a place where his repentance would be scoffed at, his reformation not believed. He hesitated for a few moments. <clears throat> right. And then turned away to wander where he might and seek his bread elsewhere. The lantern, spade and wicker bottle were found that day in the churchyard. At first, there was much speculation in the town about the sexton's fate. But it was speedily determined that, in fact, he had been carried away by goblins. 
and there was no shortage of very credible witnesses to this and even stranger sights. I saw him whisking through the air on the back of a chestnut horse that was blinding one eye and it had the hind quarters of a lion and the tail of a bear. At length, all this was devoutly believed. The new sexton began to exhibit, for a trifling fee of course, a good-sized piece of the church weathercock. This, he claimed, had been kicked off by the chestnut horse in its flight and picked up by himself in the churchyard. Unfortunately, some ten years afterwards, these stories were somewhat disturbed by the unlooked-for reappearance of Gabriel Grubb, a ragged, contented, rheumatic old man. He told his story to the clergyman and the mayor, and in time, it began to be received as a matter of revised history. But having misplaced their confidence once, the believers in the weather cocktail were not easily persuaded to part with it again. So they looked as wise as they could, shrugged their shoulders and made their excuses. He must have drunk all the gin and then fallen asleep in the tombstone. I say that he saw no goblins or Kevin. He's just seen more of the world and grown wise. Yeah. Be that as it may, Gabriel Grubb was afflicted with rheumatism to the end of his days. So this story has at least one moral. But if a man or woman turns sulky and drink by themselves at Christmas, they make up their mind to be not a bit the better for it. Let the spirits never be as good, or let them be even as many degrees beyond proof as those which Gabriel Grubb saw in the Goblin's Cavern on Christmas Eve. In the Goblins Who Stole a Gravedigger on Christmas Eve, you heard the voices of Lisa Nightingale, Jim Newberry, Mike Ayres and Miss Romy Todd. It was adapted and directed by Jim Newberry, with a soundscape realised by Robbie Burgess. It is a joint Old Dolly and PeopleScope production. Scope production.